So let's get going. So now we know how to write it, what to write, what software, what software to use. Is there any other softwares that you recommend, or Skidner? Uh, Grammarly, Grammarly is a, a okay. really cool, uh, cool thing you can install on your computer, and mm -hmm. it works across all softwares, although I'm not sure it actually works inside Scrivener now that I say <laughs> that. But uh, now I have not installed it, um, okay. uh, so I'm kind of doing this based on the recommendation of other people, Got but it. from the people that I've spoken to, Grammarly is a pretty cool one. It just makes sure that you're, you're writing it in okay. the right way. Yeah. So how long should it take to write a book? Well, uh, that's like asking how long is a piece of string, right? It's just <laughs> yeah. as long as it is. Um, I will tell you that there are certain things that you can do or not do which will lengthen that time. Mm -hmm. But it is what it is. I think people need to, to shoot for as short of a time frame as possible. For us, and you know this, we push our clientele to write the book in three weeks. Now that doesn't mean it gets done in three weeks, but the main content is written inside a three week period of time. Yep. Most of the stuff that you would enter into the Scrivener, yep. that doesn't include the editing and the, maybe the research later to back up some facts that you've written on all that stuff. That might be another three, four, five, six weeks, maybe even longer. Mm -hmm. But just the writing itself, and, and by the way, everybody's different, so it could be, you know, that strategy may not work. But for the most part, if people try doing it at their own pace, uh, have some free time, it just doesn't work. It's more of like a rip the band-aid off strategy. Mm -hmm. Write it as fast as you can. And I'll share with you a personal experience. My first book, Settle for Excellence, that I wrote took me nearly 10 years wow. to write. And the reason for that is because I would write it for a little while, and then I'd walk away. Because mm -hmm. I was like, oh man, I've been doing this for a week now, or two weeks, and I'm burnt <laughs> out. I, and I didn't have any of these strategies, so it was really hard for me to write, and it was in different orders. And then I'd walk away from it for a couple of months, mm -hmm. six months sometimes. And I go, okay, I gotta finish this book. So <laughs> then I sit down, and then because it was so long, I wouldn't remember what I wrote, so what did I do? I have to read the whole thing that I wrote. <laughs> So as I start to read, I go, huh, I don't really believe this anymore. I've evolved my thinking. So then I would delete that whole section and then rewrite it. So I actually probably wrote four or five books in that time frame because I just kept deleting content and re-adding new stuff because I would evolve and grow. And this is the big thing that a lot of people is like, well, I don't want to write a book because if I do, it'll stay permanent forever. Yeah, I get that. Write a second edition. Exactly. Right? Write a third edition, a fourth edition. Mm -hmm. That's okay. You can evolve. You can change. You have the freedom and the right to do that. And you just come up with a second edition for it. That's yeah. what I did. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So now if we have written it, then two couple things. Mm -hmm. How do you copyright it? Should you copyright it? If yeah. you want to quote somebody else in the book, how mm -hmm. do you go by that? Well, so let me preface all of this by saying I am not an attorney. So everything <laughs> I'm about to say right now, you should not believe, you should not trust, you yeah. should actually call an intellectual property attorney and get their advice. So okay. everything <laughs> I'm telling you is crap right now, right? <laughs> I'm not an attorney, I don't want to make advice. As I understand the law, uh -huh. um, anytime you put anything into print, be it paper or digital, uh -huh. it is in America after a certain, I think it was like 1970 something, I can't remember the date, it's legally copyrighted. Okay. So you don't have to file the copyright, it's copyrighted. Mm -hmm. But just because you've written it and it is legally by creation copywritten, mm -hmm. if you do not go to the, uh, uh, the federal, uh, I think it's called the US Patent and Trademark, or uh, just search and just Google uh, intellectual property copywriting or something like that, and it'll pop up the number one website. If you do not go to that website, and pay the 25, 35 bucks, it's not a lot, mm -hmm. and actually file for the copyright. What's the difference between having a copyright and filing for the copyright? If you own the copyright because you just typed it, uh -huh. that's fine, you own it. But what, it, it, what does it do? Nothing. You cannot pursue legal action about anybody who oh, got it. copies, copies it. it. Mm -hmm. Yep. The only way you can pursue legal action for that person is you've actually filed the copyrights through the trademark copyright, uh, forget what it's called. Yeah, but I will do that. Now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it is worthwhile to actually take the manuscript, submit it in. It's only like, like I said, it's like 25, 35 bucks. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot. Um, you, you can either hire an attorney to do it and it'll cost you know, maybe a couple hundred bucks because they'll yeah. make sure it's done right and you just go online and do it yourself. But you, you must do that if you ever feel like you need to protect it. Now, quoting somebody is a a little mm -hmm. bit different, right? Yeah. Um, and once again, I'm not a lawyer, I can't give advice, <laughs> so this one I'm even more nervous to give advice on, I would just say this, never put anything in your book that you don't have permission to put in your book. Yeah. That's probably a pretty safe rule, right? Are there ways you can get away with it without putting it in? Yeah, there's some public domain and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, and people have been, di you, can, you can probably quote Mark Twain and you're probably fine, right? Yeah. I don't think his lineage is gonna come after you and sue you. But once again, 
If you don't have permission, a good rule of thumb is don't put it in the book. Um, and beyond that, I'd say call an attorney. Okay, yep. that's a really good advice. My, but yeah, I just don't <laughs> want to get in trouble later. That's yeah, okay. He told me I could quote Michael Jordan. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> How about, well, at least they should ask, and if they say, Michael Jordan says in an email back, yeah. that yeah, you can use my quote, then that's Yeah, there story. are certain industries that are very <laughs> copyright protective. Okay. Um, so for example, the music industry. Mm -hmm. um, I would virtually feel, I feel safe saying that if you want to quote the lyrics of a, of a, a musician, uh -huh. and you put the whole song lyric in there. That's a problem. That's a problem. <laughs> I know for a fact, I know okay. a guy who actually put the, um, some lyrics from a Garth Brooks song, uh -huh. and, uh, and he actually, he had to, he had to stop the print. I can't remember what it was, but he had to contact. I think it was Sony Records to actually get permission wow. uh, to do it. So, yeah, certain industries are, are very picky, finicky about them. Finicky, yeah. picky, yeah, whatever. Yeah. So, how about uh, getting a forward from somebody else from the industry? Who should you get it from, and how do you ask for one? Gotcha. All right, cool. So, this is an interesting one. Um, first off, the forward needs to be from somebody who is a person of influence in that industry already. I get people all the time, like my clients, who go, hey, would you write my forward for my book? And I'm like, my name doesn't really mean anything in your industry. There's very few books that I've written forwards for. Mm -hmm. I can't, did I do something for yes, you? Yes, mine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you might be the only one, actually. I think mm -hmm. you and maybe one other person I've written books for. Okay. Um, uh, and, uh, and I probably even discouraged you from picking me, but we, we, I remember yeah. we had a conversation about it, and, and, and even though, like, I'm, not, I'm nothing in the gym world, mm -hmm but I'm a small fish in the business development world, which is where yes. you were at with it. Yes. So um, your person who writes your forward should be a person of influence, should have some level of name recognition such that if people see that person's name on your book, they'll be more inclined to buy it. Yes. And the one thing that I hear all the time is people go, wow, but I don't know any famous people, I don't know any people of influence, blah, 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 say, how am I gonna do that? Tweet them, <laughs> exactly. you know? I mean, that's yeah. uh, um, Alex Rodriguez with Yummy Marketing or uh, with uh, uh, the book uh, Digital Bacon, he had, oh, uh, what's his name? Um, I'm blanking it, very famous blogger. Uh -huh. He tweeted him and, and said, I'm writing a book on digital marketing. I would be my, you know, I'd be honored to have you write my uh, forward, Chris Brogan. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and, and Chris responded to the tweet and goes, here, email me here. And he sent it over and Chris loved the book and he wrote the, wrote the forward. Oh, that's sort awesome. Sort of a tweet, right? Yep. Um, so what I say is this, find 10 people that you think would be a great candidate to write your forward, send an email, send a letter, send a tweet, whatever it is, right? All Reach of them. All of them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one out of 10 is gonna hit. Yeah. yeah, perfect. And if you get two or three or four, that's great. Now you got jacket cover endorsement, now you've got preface, you got intro, you, you, can, you can prologue, you can put them all over the place. So if now that it's all finished, the book is finished, well, you've wrote it, where do you go for editing, the inside, the outside, the cover, yeah. all that, is it, if if you go private and like to self-publish or you go to a publisher and how should you pick that? Yeah, so before you get into the, the editing route, you really need to determine first how you're gonna publish the book. Okay. Because how you determine, uh, because how you publish the book will determine whether or not those services are included in or, yeah. the package, right? So the last thing you wanna do is drop a couple of grand mm -hmm. on an editor and then have a publishing company come on board and go, we'd like to represent you because they're gonna take everything you just did, they're gonna run it through their editors, yeah, and it's exactly. gonna be redone anyway. So um, so let's talk about publishing options first, and okay. then we'll talk about uh, editing. So there's essentially, I guess, I, I break it down into four different types of publishing. Mm -hmm. The first one is I refer to as self-printing, some people call that vanity publishing, mm -hmm. but what you do is you actually go to a local printer with your PDF file and your TIFF or your JPEG or your PDF graphic of the book and you give it to them and you pay them to print your book in mass quantities. That's what we do, for example, with the KPI books, the Key Person of Influence book. Mm -hmm. We do self-printing. Why? Because we use them as gifts, we give them away, and if we were to pay on demand, we'd be spending about four, five, six, seven bucks a book, mm -hmm. but if we print a thousand at a time, we can get them down for like 220, 280 a book, right? So if you, you know, really kind of gotta ask yourself, how are you gonna utilize the book? If it's gonna be designed as a free giveaway, then vanity publishing or self-printing might be the way to go because it'll be your lowest cost per unit. The downside to that is that it's also your highest upfront cash out, right? Because mm -hmm. you're gonna have to spend fee three, four, five grand to get enough books done yes. to where it's cost effective. That's the first option. Uh, the second option is you could go through um, 
self-publishing options. Uh, and this has also been referred to as printing on demand. So there's lots of options out there. Uh, Amazon has a thing called CreateSpace. I'm not really a fan of it, um, but its quality has gotten better over the years. Um, the one that I still recommend is IngramSparks.com. Uh, that is a great self-publishing arm where you can upload the files and they can print them on demand. You pay a little bit more, but you never have to have a big, huge inventory of them. And what's great about Ingram Sparks versus, for example, CreateSpace is CreateSpace is a self-publishing arm on Amazon. If you use them, your books will be on Amazon, and that's it. Mm -hmm. If you go through Ingram Sparks and you upload ebooks there, it'll be on Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com, Powell Books. It'll be on every single digital retail platform that's out there because Ingram Sparks is kind of the 800-pound gorilla in the world of publishing. Um, and that's a great way to do it, uh, especially if you want to have minimal outlay in cash, is to just go through the self-publishing or print-on-demand. And there's lots of companies out there. If anybody just Googles print-on-demand authorship, they're going to find tons. Yep. Yeah. Or self-publishing options, something like that. And before we get into that, yeah. by the way, should you publish on uh, Kindle, meaning like digital PDF, or I mean ebook, regular book, audio book, all of them, or how should you pick? Yes, so all, all of the above. Them. Yeah, okay. the more format you have, the better. Now, but there's a there's a budget with all of those. I know you got your entire uh, yeah. uh, Fitbiz book on audiobook. Yes, and you didn't read that. You hired somebody to do yeah. that. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Efficient with your time. What'd you pay for that? I paid, uh, what you call it, he gets, I believe, 40% of the profits of the book. Well, that's how it was. Okay, so yeah. you actually split the profits. That's cool. So yeah. there was no a cash outlay up front. Nope. Wonderful Hopefully deal. Free. Yeah. yeah, well, that's yeah. a pretty good deal. Actually, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't even know this. Yeah, I learned something now. Yeah. yeah that's cool. <laughs> and now, maybe now I'll actually start getting mine on audiobooks. And, yeah. and by the way, just to let you guys know that uh, my audiobook is actually getting bought like quite a few times. So yes. meaning it's going on and on and on constantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I receive the, uh, well not checks, but the auto deposit notices. Mm -hmm. And I actually make a few hundred dollars every other week basically through audiobooks because they are buying it constantly, which That's is awesome. Right. The best part, mm -hmm. the person who read it, um, I found it out of about 25 people auditioned for my book. Mm -hmm. So they read about 15 minutes of your book from different chapters and mm -hmm. then you listen to it. And this guy was sounded awesome. So anyway, once interesting. It, yeah, once it published it, mm -hmm. um, I mean, we published it on audiobook. Then all of a sudden, uh, I just start getting notifications every two weeks. Basically, I get um, not a check, but notification for auto or direct deposit to my account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a few hundred dollars. So it's like it's I get bad, man. for doing nothing, yeah. right? It's just coming in. So that also means that guy also getting about 150 bucks. That's great uh, per month doing do nothing. Do you uh, do you think that is attributed to the fact that he is a um, does he like? Um, uh, does his clientele get a notification that he's written another book, or do you think it has anything to do with it, or is it just really the Fitbiz phenomenon just taking off? I have no idea about that, but uh, I though. did start promoting the book a lot on uh, my social media accounts, yep. and since then uh, I see that that it's just picking up more and more, and mm. then now my audience on Instagram, Facebook, but since you have a podcast, mm -hmm. they're all gym owners and personal trainers, and that's what the book is you know, for. So I mm, feel like that uh, because I got so many wives yeah. actually who message me. By the way, that's probably what it is. It has nothing okay. to do with him. It's the fact you have such a specific niched book, yeah. and you're so good at marketing in all those areas that it's just a natural progression for people to want to get. Thank it. you. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. So, but yeah, definitely yeah. Does, get into as many formats as you possibly can because some yes. people will hate reading, but they love listening. Yeah. So mm -hmm. good one. So now then, how about if you want to go, or should you go self-publishing, or should you go to? Correct, yeah, so we talked about self-printing, then we talked about self-publishing, mm -hmm. then there's traditional publishing. So traditional publishing is you go out and you get a literary agent, um, and that literary agent shops your book to the big publishers, like Hay House, and Simon & Schuster, there we go, um, McGraw-Hill, like those big companies. And there's also smaller ones out there as well. So they'll shop your book to a publishing company, and if a publishing company buys, then what happens is they'll typically offer you an advance, um, and your literary agent will take a percentage of your advance, much like a real estate agent takes a percentage of the, of the home that they sell, right? Um, and you usually have to go with a literary agent. There are cases of people who've gone straight to publishers and pitched it, but you really got to know how to do a book proposal mm -hmm. at that point in time. Um, and unless you have a really large platform, it's just usually not worth it. I mean, most lit agents won't even pick you up if you don't have a platform of at least of 100,000 followers that are actively engaged and whatnot. There's so, your answer. Yeah. Um, but listen, there's a lot of people that are going to be watching this that might have a, a really great, uh, they might have a podcast of their own where they got 3 million subscribers or something mm -hmm. like that. You go to a publishing company, you got a couple million subscribers, they'll look at you. 
they, they will. Have, what would be? What do you think? What would be their offer? Or should you even try to pitch to uh, uh, publishers or no? Uh, this is one of those things where me, as a person who's never had a traditional publishing uh -huh. company ever come to me and offer me a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollar advance to write a book, I can sit here so easily in my judgmental <laughs> tone and go, you don't really need uh, traditional <laughs> publishers. Yeah, you know, hybrid or self published. Oh, really good. But listen, uh, if Simon and Schuster called me tomorrow and offered me a big advance for a book, I'd probably be going, that's the way to go, right? So <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I know I've got some friends of mine that have turned down book offers with mm -hmm. Simon and Schuster McGraw Hill because they make so much money on well, their self-published books. Yeah. yeah, they're just they've got a marketing machine. They don't need them. I mean, the whole thing about publishing companies itself is a little bit obsolete in that they were designed long before we ever had our own distribution channels to be able to reach the market. Remember, I mean, this was a technology made like in the I don't know, well, I don't know how long has the books been out, twenties <laughs> and the thirties, right? Yep. Yep. So. That was before we had the internet and we could actually do that stuff. Nowadays we can do it all on our own, so we don't yeah. need them as much. Um, and that being said, there's something kind of badass about having a book and it says Simon & Schuster, yeah, McGraw true. Hill. Yeah. I get that, right? And I'd probably be jumping all over going, huh? <laughs> So who knows? The fourth option yep. is what we refer to as hybrid publishing. Mm -hmm. And it is the best of both worlds from pu traditional, pu here's the downside with traditional publishing. If, if Simon & Schuster would, were to call me or call you and say, run and buy the book, here's what might happen. Before that book is printed, they might add two or three additional chapters that you didn't even write, but it's <laughs> going to be on your name. They might take one or two chapters that, they, that you wrote and delete it. Sounds like a movie. It's literally, they have total control. They, they might they go, FitBiz, what a lame name. We're <laughs> changing that to BizFit, and they'll change the name of your book, you have no say, in traditional publishing. Mm -hmm. Yep. So those are some downsides. You they lose a lot of freedom. You lose your autonomy. It essentially is basically what you're doing is you're essentially taking your baby that you created and letting them adopt it and then have they have a right to do whatever they want. Yeah. Hybrid public self-publishing, you can do whatever you want. You can name it whatever you want, distribute it wherever you want, but it's harder, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Hybrid publishing gives you the best of both worlds okay. and it's nice. So a hybrid publishing is you own the intellectual property. You still have control over the rights. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you print them on demand typically, but they're not as expensive as you were to do self-publishing. Um, but you have a distribution arm that allows you to still get into bookstores, but you don't have to give up the farm and your identity and stuff. So there's, some, there's, a, there's a give and take on both. And how would that work? Meaning, like you said, uh, if they go hybrid, then means they take half of the cut of the book? or It really depends upon the different types of okay. companies. The one that I, of course, recommend is Morgan James Publishing. Okay. I, I recommend them, number one, because I've gone two books through them, and they've treated me very well, and I love them. Um, now, what Morgan James does, and everybody has a different plan, but basically, if you go through a hybrid, you're probably going to cut a check sometime mm -hmm. for probably around five grand. Okay. Most of them, that's kind of your entry point. Some of them are 10, 12, 14, 15 grand, mm -hmm. um, but probably somewhere in that area. Now, the way it works with Morgan James is... Um, and I hope I can represent them well in this video. <laughs> so hopefully they don't call me back and go, yeah, you just screwed it up. So what Morgan James does is they require that if they're gonna hybrid, they're gonna publish your book, they need, a, they need a certain level of guarantee that they're gonna be able to make enough sales off the book to cover all of the expenses in creating it, which is fair, right? So what they do is they ask the author to pay, if they, if, like if you wanted 100 books, you would pay cost plus two, meaning you'd pay the cost of the book plus two dollars on top of every book. So if it costs two dollars, mm -hmm. let's do simple math, if it costs three dollars to print the book, you're gonna pay five dollars a book. Got it. Right, cost plus two. Mm -hmm. And then what they do is they do that um, uh, to help protect them to make sure that even if they don't, if it's not a bestseller, they've at least covered their expenses, right? Now, the way that they do that is they charge you for the first 2,500 books up front. So you stroke a check for five grand, you mm -hmm. just paid your plus two for the first 500 books. Yes. Or uh, uh, first uh, 2,500 so 2, books. Yep. Yes. So then what happens is if you want to order 100 books, you just, you just pay cost because you've already paid your plus two. Yep. Make sense? Got it. Yes. Now let's say the book hits, takes off, sells tens of thousands. That's cool, right? So what happens then is once you've sold that first 5,000, then you're back up to cost plus two. 
Yeah, got yeah. it. Uh, and that's fair. I'm, uh, frankly, I'd much rather pay cost plus two to never have to inventory my books, never have to worry about refunding any of my books, never having to do anything other than simply just go online and go, oh, there's my book, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, the benefit of them is that they can also get it into bookstores. Got it, that's so, awesome. So what's your biggest motivation? If you really want your book in bookstores, you've got to self-publish, sorry, you've got to uh, hybrid publish or traditional publish. Self-publishing, you just, it's the the yeah, it's real yeah. hard. Yeah. But if you Not impossible, but it's hard. But if you self-publish, they can still buy it eventually, right? Or no. Bookstores? Not bookstores, um, publishers? publishers. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, there's been lots of people where they, they publish their own book, they sell hundreds of thousands, and all of a sudden the publishing company goes, man, if they sell this many self-publishing, we could save millions if we actually market it. Market it. And, yeah. and by the way, sometimes they just take the name and change the name and re Re release really book. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So last question because we're running out of time. I know there's lots yeah. of content. And this everything. was supposed to be 30 minutes. Yeah. Like, yammer, yammer, yammer. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so I, because you actually told me this and it worked, but uh -huh. what would be the recommendation to? <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> <laughs> to uh, to market the book and to make it a bestseller on Amazon. Uh, okay. So. Yeah, this is something that's changed over the years. I remember when I published my first mm -hmm. book. Uh, to become a bestseller on Amazon, basically you had to be in the top 50 mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was hard to do, yeah. right? Now they've done this thing where they've got subcategories. Mm -hmm. And they've got sub-subcategories, right? So for example, with you, I think we had you do it's business. Leadership. Leadership. Mentoring. Mentoring, right? And there's all these little yeah. subcategories. Yes. And you can pick three subcategories inside mm -hmm. the nonfiction route, mm -hmm. right? So it could be like nonfiction, business, leadership. Nonfiction, business, mentorship, right? So yes. you can pick these subcategories. Um, and you can actually go online to Amazon and look and see how many books they sell currently on Amazon.com in that area. Yeah. Well, if you're going to a category that's got 200,000 books, you're competing with 200,000 books. Yes. So you gotta get in the top 50 or top, I think it's top 50 of 200,000 books. Yes. But if you can find a subcategory that's only got 2,000 books, well, now you have to just be in the top 50 of 2,000 competitors, right? Yep. So if you're strategic about how you categorize the book, and it has to make sense. I mean, you can't yeah, sit there and go, my book's called Fit Business. I'm going to put it in the category of nonfiction, uh, gardening, uh, <laughs> bee pollen, right? I mean, you can't do that, yep. right? It's got to make sense. Yep. But if you have the right subcategories, you've increased exponentially your odds of being able to sell. And the other thing is that Amazon measures their bestsellers on an hourly basis. So what yes. it means is you only have to be in the top 50 for one hour. So you can sell relatively few books and get into bestseller status if you have the right subcategory and you market it well to where you set it out like this is the launch time folks. I want everybody to go buy it between this time and this time. Yep. And it's it's pretty easy. Yeah. Perfect, because yeah. that's what I'm gonna do with my next book. And it'll be a bestseller, I have no doubt about it. Well, you. you're stayed on the bestseller list yeah. for quite a while though. Yes. Because once you're there, then they get they bump it up and it gets yep. exposure and it starts creating a snowball effect. And I think uh, it was in two categories, mm -hmm. and then the third one was a number two, the second on the that's list. That's great. But I was competing against uh, Scaling Up, the Gazelle, Gazelle's book, mm -hmm. which was number two, and some really good books actually. Yeah, and by the way, that kind of feels good, doesn't yeah, it? When you sit there and go, wow, these are some of my idols, yep. and I'm ahead of, I remember <laughs> when, uh, my first book, Settle for Excellence, uh, that was just, you had to be all over, right? Yeah. Yeah. And at one point in time, I, was, I, I felt pretty proud. I was out selling Harry Potter. <laughs> That's awesome. For one hour, yeah. I outsold <laughs> Harry Potter. Feel pretty good about that one. Yeah. <laughs> also, I mean, thank you very much, Topher, for my bringing pleasure. it today. I yeah. really appreciate it, and I really think that the audience... Hope so. I hope you enjoyed yeah. it. Definitely. I mean, I... The number one was obviously the reason why they keep asking me to create this episode because so many people want to write their book, but they always get stuck. So yeah. I think we give them enough information that now they can at least get started and finish yeah. it up. Yeah, let's hope they do. It'd be nice yeah. to see some books come out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.